I've spent several years studying uh, clinical informatics, uh, its effect on economics and healthcare, and really have spent a significant amount of time uh, with uh, studying the primary objective of how we as anesthesiologists can leverage clinical informatics resources to help develop our value proposition in a changing healthcare environment. And I think that's critically important following the passage of the ACA back in 2009, um, and has even become more important as we've actually seen the realization of those changes um, in, uh, and the actual implementation of those changes in, in the healthcare environment. So reference pricing, pricing is essentially the ACA's way of, um, of uh, redefining a mechanism of, of value proposition or redefining a way to, to define value in healthcare. And the primary objective of that is to uh, look at a, a care redesign initiative or look at, look at a type of a surgery um, or, or a touch point in care and define a reimbursement in terms of the value that it provides uh, to the entire longitudinal experience for the patient. And this is, uh, in, in layman's terms, this is a, a new way of describing a bundle payment. And that actual redefinition of, in the healthcare environment uh, took place um, back in May. And around that time, we started to see uh, several changes in the literature, and in fact, a publication from Elliot Benaguerrero down from Duke uh, that looked at uh, hemodynamic monitoring in high-risk surgical patients. So we have this changing environment in healthcare where we not only have passed the legislation responsible for redefining how we're going to provide care, but we're starting to see the implementation of those policies, and we're starting to see how they may affect how we uh, redefine our care modeling in the operating room. So I'm going to talk a little bit about value and value delivery in healthcare, and then talk more about uh, how we can leverage goal-directed goal fluid therapy as anesthesiologists to enhance our value delivery or our value proposition as anesthesiologists in the perioperative environment. And I'm going to conclude the conversation this evening uh, by talking about a budget impact analysis that I've worked with NICOM to define um, in an attempt to help look at health economics and the health economics of goal-directed fluid therapy um, in this environment. So uh, before I went to uh, business school, I really didn't know much about value. Um, in fact, uh, the only real definition that I had of value is uh, that it's defined in terms of monetary worth. Um, and in fact, when you get to business school, that's actually the most accurate definition that you can describe. Um, in healthcare, however, uh, you know, we don't really define um, uh, value in terms of monetary worth. Um, and so while outside of healthcare, you can look at value and you can compare things uh, such as cars and you can say, you know, it's really easy to justify the differences between two vehicles based on their value or based on their monetary worth. In healthcare, we've defined it as sort of an equation um, and outcomes being the numerator in that equations and costs, of course, being the denominator. And when we look at outcomes in healthcare, it's critically important that we look at it um, in terms of being comprehensive and longitudinal in a patient-centered or a patient-specific uh, care model. Um, similarly, when we looked at cost, we can just simply look at it in terms of dollars spent. Um, and this, uh, of course, derives the term cost-effectiveness. So when we look at the equation in value in healthcare and we say that it's in terms of outcomes over costs, um, we look at very, various different metrics to help define what that could be. Um, most importantly, we look at efficiency metrics, satis patient satisfaction metrics, patient safety metrics, quality metrics, and of course, business intelligence modeling. And so we do a lot of that now um, with the primary objective, again, of, of repositioning ourselves um, as, a, as a valuable entity in a changing healthcare landscape. And the, the most natural way that we've uh, defined this in, in, in locally at Duke and um, in some of the projects that we've worked on is under an umbrella of care redesign initiatives. So how can we package up all of these different concepts into one uh, comprehensive entity, roll it out as a clinical paradigm, um, measure the outcomes, and then bring that, that targeted initiative to another space in care? Um, and, and, uh, and we've used the, the, um, the vehicle of the care redesign initiative to do that. So when you think about value and value delivery in healthcare, um, really essentially what we're trying to do as providers is take the value that we've developed, um, that we've created as an entity, and deliver it to patients. And leveraging clinical and operational tools, big data, um, quality improvement initiatives, and things of that nature to do that. Um, so what, what does value and value delivery look like in the perioperative environment? 
Um, essentially, you can put it under various different metrics, but we focus primarily on charge capture and billing and reimbursement modeling, supply chain, man supply chain management, clinical efficiency, staffing models, and of course these care redesign initiatives that I just spoke about. So when we think about perioperative value um, proposition for anesthesiologists, uh, where, where you want to focus um, is essentially in places where you can expand your sphere of control and your sphere of influence um, to uh, map more coordinated, in a more coordinated manner with your sphere of care. And mechanisms to, before, you, when you're thinking about defining those uh, mechanisms, what you really want to look at is, you know, what are we passionate about? What are we best in the world at? And what drives our economic engine? And when, if you can find a place where all three of those thematic um, entities can overlap, uh, you're certainly in an excellent place and you're, excellent and, and you're perfectly positioned to, to change care in that model. So in the operating room, or perioperatively for anesthesiologists, our sphere of control is essentially what we're used to, what we're great at, where we've been able to show significant improvements in safety and quality, and that's in the operating room. And what the challenge is here during the care redesign initiative and during uh, healthcare remodeling is to essentially expand that, that sphere of control uh, perioperatively to the preoperative management of, of patients and to the postoperative management in the critical care. And so in doing so, the hope is to uh, take a fragmented system that focuses around the surgeon and really make it a patient-centered experience. And so how does this all fit in with hemodynamic monitoring? Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Bene Guerrero published this study back in, um, in May where it essentially looked at goal-directed uh, monitoring in high-risk surgical patients. And he tried to uh, write the editorial around all the different literature that had been published on this in the last couple of years. And what he concluded was that, uh, compared with the previous meta-analysis that was done, the updated analysis had added seven additional trials that showed statistically significant reduction in complications, infections, and hospital stay for patients who received goal-directed therapy. And as we uh, discussed in our previous two presentations, that there was an, you know, not only is the clinical efficacy becoming more and more clear as we do more uh, clinical trials, but the, the evolution of and the choice of monitors um, is becoming uh, far more geared to minimally invasive solutions. Um, and, and Dr. Ben Guerrero discussed esophageal monitoring, bioreactance, bioimpedance, um, as well as uses of arterial catheter technology to uh, define those metrics. What he did say and what he concluded was that goal-directed therapy is easier to implement with these new technologies because they require less training and in most cases are easily interpreted by a wide range of caregivers, and that the comparative effectiveness between these different monitoring devices is somewhat difficult to discern from the literature. Um, but perhaps most importantly, and what I think is, is absolutely, again, critically important to the success of our subspecialty as we move forward um, in, a, in a redefined model, is that goal-directed therapy is best achieved in environments that emphasize a multidisciplinary team approach to patient care, including anesthesiologists, surgeons, intensivists, and nurses. And this approach is best exemplified by the perioperative surgical home, which is gaining momentum as a model to improve outcomes and reduce costs. So this all became, you know, this whole process to me was extraordinarily interesting because we have, you know, a, a clinical situation where we were very sure about the, the implications of, of, um, of goal-directed therapy on clinical outcomes and morbidity in the perioperative environment. We know that this is a time where healthcare is going gonna, is gonna to change and that our reimbursement models and our care models are going to have to change with it in order to uh, maintain our, viabil our viability and our value proposition perioperatively. But for some reason, widespread use of goal-directed therapy, particularly in the United States, has not been accomplished. And the obstacles that I see and that, that we often see every day in our clinical practice is that we have limited resource availability, uh, particularly um, with regard to capital equipment purchasing uh, costs perioperatively and in, in the entire perioperative environment, and that there's additional costs associated with acquisition and maintenance of new devices, and certainly that there's an ongoing academic debate about the clinical and cost effectiveness of this technique. Um, and so with this hypothesis that the data on the cost effectiveness and budget impact model um, for hemodynamic monitoring is limited um, and that we know the changing landscape for new device integration is becoming more complex, um, 
we felt that in order to be successfully deployed in a new um, healthcare environment, a device would have to be um, valuable not only in terms of safety and efficiency, but also in terms of effic efficacy, quality, and cost effectiveness. So that was kind of the premise of the, um, of the poster presentation that I'm presenting here at the ASA this year and on a lot of work that we've done um, in the background to help uh, create and redefine a predictive model to help implement a new technology um, for hemodynamic monitoring. So we created a model that leveraged data on mean length of stay and, length of st and mean length of stay reduction um, on uh, hemodynamic monitoring for goal-directed fluid therapy. And we used Cheetah and ICOM as an example of a validated hemodynamic monitoring device because uh, we were most familiar with the data on uh, NICOM and we felt that expansion of that data to other um, uh, hemodynamic monitoring devices couldn't necessarily be uh, adequately done relying solely on the data that was published. Um, we created customized variables that allowed to allow hospital leadership to enter proprietary enterprise data into the model and then in the end leveraged the model to synthesize the data comprehensively to provide cost avoidance and budget impact um, analysis for patient specific and aggregate form. So here's an example of what the model looks like and I think you know giving a presentation and talking about it using PowerPoint is somewhat challenging um, uh, because it's extraordinarily specific and very detailed um, and will actually become uh, much more apparent uh, during the presentation on Tuesday. Um, but there's essentially five different parts to the model, um, and it allows enterprise leadership to enter different information depending on what the demographics of the hospital um, is. And so if you look at the demographics page and explode that piece out, it allows um, the user to input data on the number of beds in the hospital, the number of ICU beds, um, the occupancy, occupancy rate of the ICU, um, and even allows information for patient admissions per year uh, to the hospital. Once those assumptions are entered, um, the, the um, analysis then uh, leverages data from validated studies um, to provide information on suggested mean length of stay reduction um, for the patients that uh, were entered into the model. Um, and then the final part of the demographics piece of the model allows for um, information to be entered on the sensor cost, um, capital equipment purchasing, and the number of monitors and devices that are essentially uh, planned to be purchased by the, uh, the enterprise. And then as I alluded to, there's several different sections of the, of the analysis or of the model that um, uh, allows enterprise leadership to not only enter information about um, the, the grand 10,000 foot perspective of the hospital, but also of each individual piece of the hospital and how that fits into uh, the planned capital equipment purchase. And so there's uh, specific and proprietary information about the emergency department, um, about the ICU, um, and about the perioperative environment. And then the model synthesizes all this information into a summary page uh, that then provides um, the results in both aggregate and patient-specific form. Um, and so uh, the information is uh, provided in a very clear format um, in a summary page uh, that's in a language that most CFOs and most enterprise leadership are used to looking at. And once again, it's extraordinarily powerful when you sit down at a meeting and look at this because it's durable, it's flexible, um, it's customizable, and if the numbers don't pass the gut test for the, uh, for the CFO or for the uh, the chief executive officer, he can literally change the numbers on the fly and adjust them um, uh, as they, as they, to, to what they think is more applicable to their everyday environment. And once again, it provides all this information in, in aggregate form um, and then allows enterprise leadership to look at it in a single page um, in a clear format. So once again, I think the, the powerful pieces of this um, from an anesthesiology perspective, and for me personally, um, has been that it allowed me to speak the language that the, that the executive leadership was looking for to make a capital equipment purchase uh, that could then be used for a targeted initiative to help improve care. And as I alluded to, I think that's becoming more and more important as we move forward um, under, a, under a, um, a changing healthcare environment. Uh, because we really need to not only show that our, our initiatives are clinically appropriate, 
um, or, that they're, uh, or that they're efficacious or that they're based on literature, but also that we can find a way to fit this into a capital equipment purchasing budget that is um, being substantially reduced over time. So the main points of the model being durable, customizable, comprehensive, specific, and yet, again, data-driven. So to conclude about the economics as it relates to this space, um, I think, uh, you know, it's becoming extraordinarily clear that if change hasn't already arrived, it's certainly coming. Um, and the two most important pieces for anesthesiology as we embrace that change is that we really need to reevaluate our value proposition in this reform environment. Who are we going to be? What, are our, what is our value? What, is, what are the things that we think we can be good at? How can we expand our sphere of, uh, of influence to include um, an entire longitudinal experience of care? Um, furthermore, I think, you know, when we think about innovation and when we think about changing the healthcare environment and healthcare landscape, we need to think about it in terms of in, an integrated and innovative solution. So instead of thinking inside the box, inside the operating room that we're traditionally um, uh, moving in, we need to expand that sphere. We need to think outside of that. We need to move into the preoperative, into the postoperative space. And goal-directed therapy, ERAS protocol is a wonderful way to, to do that. Uh, and certainly, as I mentioned, anesthesiologists perfectly positioned to embrace this change um, and goal-directed fluid therapy uh, being a value add for us in that sphere. Um, and I think, you know, the most important thing, again, for me, and, 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 a, and certainly a major frustration for me as we, um, as, we, as we moved through this process locally in our, in our institution was, you know, we had all this information available. Not only did we have randomized controlled trials in the literature that showed the efficacy of goal-directed therapy and how it could improve outcomes, but we also had local data. We had uh, local clinical data. We had local cost-effectiveness data. We even had data in terms of outcomes and costs uh, where we could show that it was actually uh, more cost-effective to implement goal-directed therapy, but we just didn't have a great way to communicate that to local enterprise leadership. And I think um, having this model really gave us the power to have that conversation um, in an effective and in an efficient way um, and in a way that uh, could really drive change locally in the, at the institution um, where we felt like we could provide some ownership of the data and some ownership of the conclusions um, um, and the results of, this, of the uh, implementation of the targeted initiative.